Hello guys and welcome to TGN the Game Nerd the Show where I talk about role play games and today we're going to be playing Zero Escape, 9 hours, 9 persons, 9 doors. In the last episode, if you don't remember, we went ahead and we made our way through the casino. It was a fun time there, played a few different games, and all around just got a great, had a great time and we found the key to unlock the grate. In this episode, we're going to go ahead and do just that, unlock the grate. Junpei and his companions ran out of the casino and into the large open room. A room, in fact, that they had been in once before. There was little surprise to them there. They already knew what their next step had to be. The iron gate still stood in place, locked tight, blocking the stairway. In the center of the gate was the keyhole, engraved with the Venus symbol. This time, however, Junpei had the Venus key in his pocket. Wasting no time, he pulled it out and shoved it into the keyhole. He turned it. With the distinctive sound of metal on metal, he felt the lock click open. Man, this game really loves the description of about the sound of metal on metal. Like, they've repeated that, I want to say, like, seven or eight different times now. Alright, let's get this thing open. Uh, no problem. Let me help with this one. Junpei grabbed the handle on his left side, and Seven took the handle on the right. On Junpei's signal, they both pushed, and the gate creaked open. It sounds as though you have opened it. We should be able to reach C deck now, I imagine. Snake, are you going to be all right? I mean, the stairs. Please do not do yourself the embarrassment of underestimating me. I, w I would be unlikely to trip even if I were running backwards. That's actually a really cool lung. Please do not do yourself the embarrassment of underestimating me. Uh, good to hear. Let's move. At Seven's words, they leapt onto the stairs and jogged qu quickly down them. In no time at all, they found themselves on C deck. Junpei ran down the stairs a little farther in hopes of checking on the deck below. When he reached the water, he called back up to Snake and Seven. Just what I thought. D deck is completely underwater. Just like the bottom of the central staircase. The, sur the surface of the water below them was flat like a mirror. And that it had not changed too greatly since they'd last seen it was a great relief. Junpei quickly retracted his steps and headed to back to C deck. In front of the stairs were a pair of elevators. They appeared to be identical to the ones from the upper floor. Between them, attached to the wall, was another card reader. Next to that one was another strange symbol. Hey, check it out. It's the symbol for Lotus. What? See, it's got the woman symbol and it's got devil horns, right? <laughs> yeah, I see it. No two ways, up, ways about it. That was a pretty good one, kid. Seven tussled Junpei's hair in what he likely thought to be a friendly manner. Junpei feared his neck might break, even though it was clear Seven had kept his strength in check. No matter what route we're going down, Junpei always has to make that joke, apparently. Thankfully, Snake interrupted. After Junpei's observation, he'd gone over to examine the card reader. Reader. Although I think that is slightly different from his joke in the route where we go down the four-door. Because he, he says the joke like, it's a woman sim symbol with a thorn in it. So, I think the first one was funnier, but, you know, works either way. This is a Mercury symbol. The marks you mistook for horns are the stylized version of the wings and staff of Hermes. Wings and staff, huh? So she beats you with the staff until you die and go to heaven? Sounds like Lotus, alright. <laughs> Someone shook Junpei's head even more vigorously, and the younger man began to feel as though his brain was being jostled about inside of this skull. His be he began to feel rather ill. Unless we can activate this device, I doubt this elevator will function. In other words, we gotta find the keycard with a mercury symbol on it. So, I would assume. They decided to leave the elevators alone for the time being and headed back to the stairs. To the left was another hallway. There were a great many doors lining both sides of the hallway. They seemed to stretch on forever, and all three men suddenly felt very small. Aw, oh, shit. We're not going to have enough time to check all of these, are we? Maybe we can come back here later. 
Let's check out the other side. They turned around and went back the way they'd come. To the right of the stairs, another hallway stretched out, reaching deep into the bowels of the ship. After a few moments of moving briskly down the hallway, they emerged into an area roughly the same size and shape as the one at the top of the stairs. On the left side of the room were four French doors. Well, let's open them up. Junpei nodded and grabbed the one closest to him. He gave, he gave it a small tug and felt it move. I almost did Seven's voice for the narration for a second. It, it was unlocked. Thrilled to have found another unlocked door, he threw it open. And Junpei didn't know what to make of what he saw. He simply stood, unable to speak. Seven's eyes opened wide and his mouth agaped. After a few long moments, Seven at last managed to speak. Hey, wha what is this place? A massive room stretched out in front of them, more a cavern than a room. Its vastness was oppressive and it bore down on Seven and Junpei. It was not empty, however. The entire room was filled with lines upon lines of beds. They were simple things, little more than pipe and thin mattresses. Is this... a hospital? He had last been able to put a name to the harsh scent that pervaded the room. The room was full of the clean smell of antiseptic solution. In the center of the room were shelves stacked with medicine and a number of medical devices, the function of which Junpei did not know. More importantly, however, on the back wall of the room were four doors. Three of them were emblazoned with large single-digit numbers made with thick red paint. The door on the left was labeled three. The second door from the left had no number, but the third had been given a seven. The door on the right bore an eight. There could be no doubt, they were numbered doors. It did strike Junpei as strange, however, that the door between three and seven should be blank. What, he wondered, it could mean. Let's take a look at those doors. Yeah, good idea. The three of them threaded their way through the beds toward the back of the room. Upon reaching them, they proceeded to investigate each door in turn, but to no avail. Yep, locked, just like I thought. Naturally. After all, there are rules to the nonary game, and to allow these doors to open easily would violate those rules. Unless we can authenticate ourselves with the red, the number of doors will... Whoa, whoa, check this out. Suddenly, Seven spoke up, interrupting Snake. Look at the red. There's nothing on it. Huh? Don't you remember the red back at the main staircase? If there wasn't anyone in it, it's at vacant on the little screen, remember? Oh yeah, you're right. But this one... There's nothing. Right? You think it's broken? Only one way to find out. Junpei and the others put their heads on the hands on the panel, but nothing happened. The red refused to change. They tried pulling the lever, and still nothing. As they soon discovered, it wasn't only the red on door 8 that seemed to be malfunctioning. The red on door 7, and the red on door 3, none of them worked. What, they wondered, did it mean? They've gotta be broken. Man, that bastard. I didn't think Zero was the kind of guy who'd screw around with something like this. Whoa, whoa. Zero's been prepared for everything so far. And you're saying he's gonna make a mistake now? Well, that's the only thing I can think of. This thing ain't working at all. While Junpei and Seven talked, Snake busied himself examining the red. After a time, he lowered his hands and spoke. It seems as if some of the internal hardware has been removed. Internal hardware? That is what I said. Take a look at the underside of this red, if you please. Junpei obliged and bent over to look at the underside of the device. A long, thin slit ran along the bottom of it. As he looked harder, he realized it was more of a slot than a slit, that it was clearly meant to accommodate some manner of electronical device. 
and the other two reds were the same. Something had clearly been removed from all three of them. I get it. So the reds aren't working because somebody pulled out their guts. So I assume. But why? And who? I mean, it doesn't really make sense. I have no idea. Why on earth would I know something like that? Just then... They heard the sound of a door opening. The three of them turned and saw... Akane! Oh no, Junpei thought. It's... June! She stopped short, surprised to see them, and was very nearly bolt bowled over by the rest of her companions, who were coming through the door behind her. Ace, Santa, Clover, and Lotus all poured out of the door, each of them as surprised as the last to see Junpei, Snake, and Seven. Junpei and Seven were, for the moment, at, l at a loss for words. What are you guys doing? Why are you... After a moment of silence and surprise, everyone suddenly began to talk, desperate to exchange information. They talked about the rooms they'd been through and how they'd ended up in the same place. Of course, none of it was very useful information, but that hardly mattered. They were happy to simply see one another again. Although the level of cheer varied greatly from person to person, each one of them was wearing some manner of smile. Almost as though they had already forgotten about the death of the ninth man. No, thought Junpei. Perhaps that wasn't it. Perhaps thoughts of his death were what drove them to smile at one another. Not in a morbid or hateful way, no. The ninth man had died. But they were still alive and that was something to be happy about. A sort of simple, uncomplicated joy, Junpei thought. The joy of being alive. Still alive. He felt sorry for the ninth man, but more than anything, Junpei was just happy to be alive. This is bad, though. If the red isn't working, we can't keep going. What about that big hallway? Maybe there's somewhere in there that we might be able to go. No, there's nothing there. The five of us had a quick look. There were a great many rooms, although none of them appeared to have held patience for quite some time. Patience? You mean all those doors are for hospital rooms? Yes. Apparently, they have a number of individual rooms in addition to this large central room. There was a door down at the end of the hallway, too, but it was locked. It had it had one of those solar system mark things on it. I haven't done Santa's voice in so long, I genuinely forgot how to do it for a sec. It was the Jupiter symbol. Jupiter. I wonder what it means. Confusion seemed to be the consensus. That reminds me, what's the deal with this big room anyway? What is this thing? Was this some kind of huge passenger ship? No one, not even Snake, appeared ready to offer an answer until Seven unexpectedly spoke up. I bet it's a hospital ship. In fact, it's probably the Gigantic. The Gigantic? Junpei looked at Seven, shocked both by his knowledge of and the apparent identity of their prison. It was not the only one. What's the... What's the Gigantic? Seven nodded to Lotus and began to speak. The Gigantic. He explained that she had been a sister ship to the Titanic, built in the early 20th century. The Titanic had two sister ships who were identical to one another in nearly every aspect. The Gigantic was said to be one of them. She was initially intended to be a passenger liner, like the Titanic, but soon after the ship was launched, the First World War began, and she was pressed into duty by the British Navy as a hospital ship. Sometime later, the Gigantic was damaged by a German mine in the Aegean Sea. I pronounced it correctly this time. She managed to run aground after the incident and consequently was not sunk. What then happened to the Gigantic after her fateful encounter in the Aegean Sea? One theory ran that a man named Lord Gordain purchased her. Lord Gordain, it seemed, had been one of the few survivors of the Titanic tragedy, and that trauma had turned him into an obsessive collector of all things related to the Titanic. As his obsession de deepened, he began to desire the Titanic himself. itself. That, of course, was impossible. The Titanic lay at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. The Gigantic, however, had not suffered such a dire fate, now she was identical to her sister ship, she caught Lord Gordain's eye. So you're saying this Lord Gordain bought the ship? Yeah. At least that's... At least I think I am. 
That's impossible. No way we're in some boat that's almost a hundred years old. Pipe down. Just pay attention. What, that's it? Well, have you got any proof? Proof? Proof that the ship is really that gigantic. Well, uh... The ship's got stuff that's like the Titanic and a hospital ship. So I just figured... Oh, for goodness. Don't tell me that's your only reason. No, no, I've got more. Like? Well, uh, I mean... Seven looked around desperately, doing anything to avoid meeting Lotus's piercing stare. He scratched his head for a moment, then gave up. Finally, he opened his mouth. Or I don't know. Lotus sighed and shook her head. I guess your memory isn't back yet, is it? No, sorry. Then, almost as if to save Seven from further embarrassment... So like I said previously, Junpei doesn't embarrass himself here by not knowing about Seven's amnesia. Bell began to ring from far away, send as those the clock at the main stairway. Junpei counted each time carefully. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. It's midnight, and we still got six hours left, right? Let's just get moving. We gotta find that hardware. The reds are missing. That's all well and good, but where are we going to look? Well, we've already searched the big patient room. They had to be examining. They'd been examining the room as they talked. But we haven't found anything. Right. Well, there's only one thing left to do. Just one? Uh, well, not just one. Wait a minute. Are you telling me that we have to search all of these rooms? Well, you already checked some of them out before you came here, right? We each checked a single room, so five rooms in total. All right then, that's five rooms we don't have to search. If if we split up, it won't be that bad. Each If each one of us can do six rooms apiece, we'll have the other 48 rooms cleared in no time. There are 48 other rooms? Lotus did not seem excited by the prospect. Seven fidgeted nervously before responding. Uh, maybe? By the way, it's not letting me skip any of this text. I've been occasionally holding down buttons on... I've been holding down the right button to try to skip, but it's not giving me anything. Discussion, eight of them decide which, which rooms. Junpei was close to the room's starboard side, moving from fore to aft. They also determined that they would return to report their findings the next time the clock sounded the time. When it did, they would meet back at the large central room full of beds. If, during their search, any one of them were to locate the missing components, they were to yell for the others. The strategy failed, they returned to discuss their opinion options later. The details decided they left to begin searching. Out into the hallway they went, each to the rooms they'd been assigned. However... Okay, finally we're allowed to skip once again. I don't know why it took so I mean, I get that there was uh, a few differences there, but we were just getting the same, like, general information. Anyways, we begin for this, the search for Snake once more, and I actually want to do something different here. Uh, I want to go back to the large hospital room like we usually do, but I actually want to talk to Santa again, because he asks us a question with multiple answers, and I want to see what he says about different ones. Let's try Lotus. Think maybe it was Lotus? They say the first person at the scene is the most suspicious. Hmm, yeah, that's possible. You don't have anything else to suggest she did it, though. You might as well just suspect everybody. Junpei furrowed his brow. So in other words, one of us is the person who fixed the red. Santa grinned. And we get the same text as before. I don't know if there's... Because I haven't actually looked through all of the options. I don't know if there's actually any, like, sort of correct option there. I don't know. Anyways, while we're skipping through this, uh, you'll definitely have noticed that in a previous episode, episode 25, I believe it was, where we went through the sub-ending, that I added in some voice acting from the remake, uh, because, of course, that version had official voice acting. And so that allows me to, uh, whenever there's a really important scene... Uh, I can just substitute it out for the official voice acting for the characters. So you can have a bit more of an immersive experience, I guess. Uh, because I just felt like I wasn't 
because I'm not like a professional voice actor or anything like that, as you can probably tell, but I just felt like for such a dramatic scene like the sub ending, I thought it would be best for me to go ahead and just use the official voice acting because, you know, they're professionals. Anyways, we want to go ahead and go through door eight. We, of course, know that there's the, uh, what's it called? The operating room? Is that it? I forget if... No, it's the laboratory. The operating room is behind door seven. Uh, I get them mixed up sometimes because there's the mannequin uh, science boy uh, behind door eight. And so I always think of that as being the operation room because he's sort of on an operating table. But no, the operating room was the one with uh, John and Lucy. Anyways, there's actually something interesting here that uh, we're going to get to in a little bit. But depending on what route you're going on, you might actually get some extra dialogue when going back through a room. And this is one of those examples. We're actually going to see both examples on this current route that we're going on. But yeah, that's one of the reasons why I didn't choose the remake is because when you're going back through the game, you just got the flowchart, so you'll just jump to the things that you need to grab, but you won't be going back to any escape rooms at any point, so you might be missing a lot of dialogue, or a lot of important dialogue, because if you go through uh, getting the endings in a certain way, there will be some semi-important dialogue that you are that you will completely miss and I just think that this format of going back through everything kind of works generally better uh, just for reasons that I've explained in the past before new dialogue what kind of job do you have what are you I'm unemployed at the moment I used to work for a cybersecurity firm but I quit why Lotus blinked. Huh? Oh, um, it was just... something. She stopped typing for a moment and her face fell. This was not an avenue of questioning to be pursued, Junpei realized, and quickly shut his mouth. Lotus's fingers began to move again, and in a few seconds she was back up to speed. She typed more letters and symbols that meant nothing to Junpei began to pour across the screen. Uh, what are you doing now? I'm going to try to brute force it. Brute... what? A brute force attack is... Well, the short version is this. It's just I attack the thing head on. The long version... Without looking up or slowing down, she began to explain. A brute force attack is one of the simplest ways to break a cipher, she told him. It checks every possible combination until it finds the right one. For a complex cipher, it can take a very long time. The thought of doing something like that made Junpei feel tired, but Lotus explained that she was writing a program that would just run just such an attack on its own. It's not the most elegant solution, certainly, but given the circumstances, there isn't much else I can do. Even as she talked, her fingers never slowed or missed a key. Junpei couldn't help but feel a little odd. Oh, but back to what we were talking about earlier. What were we talking about? The wireless display. It's kind of strange if you think about it, isn't it? Hmm? Hmm, how do I put it? Well, let's say you write a program that calculates an addition, an addition problem for you, alright? So you enter 1 plus 1. The screen will show you 2. See? Isn't that strange? Uh, uh, n no? Not really? Oh, come on now. Of course a caveman like you would think it was strange. You said so just a minute ago. Hmm? You're just not getting it, are you? Who calculated 1 plus 1? The, uh, main computer, right? He said it's connected to the monitor wirelessly. Yeah, but someone who grew up in a cave wouldn't think that, right? They'd probably think that this thing here, the monitor, is doing the calculating. And once they've decided that, they'll start examining this monitor. They might poke the screen or something. Ah, I see. The color changes when I press it here. Then they might investigate the hardware on the, on the inside. Ah, I see, so this wire supplies power. Eventually, they might even cut the wires. Ah, yes, just as I suspected. When this wire is cut, no results appear. Therefore, it must be this device which does the calculations. But the truth is that 
Just like you said, the computer is doing the calculating. But these cave people wouldn't know that, because they have no idea that the monitor and the computer are connected wirelessly. Lotus continued to type. Junpei scratched his head. So, uh... What are you trying to say? Nothing, really. It's just... I thought maybe. What if the relationship between human beings and our brains is like that? Huh? Well, let's say you stick a bunch of electrodes into parts of the brain. A scientist examining the signals they send out might say, Interesting, so stimulating this part of the brain causes the person to see colors. That must mean this neuron cluster controls the function. Okay, let's see what happens when I cut out, cut out this part. Ah, just what I thought. Cutting off this part causes the function to cease. Therefore, human thought processes must occur in the human brain. You get it? It's just like this monitor. Maybe the brain is just an output device, like this monitor. Maybe our thought processes are actually occur somewhere else in a main body. We just don't know it. It We never even think about it. Just like those cave people wouldn't know about wireless communications. We can't imagine that there's some unknown medium that transfers information into our brains where we experience that information as thoughts. Junpei didn't say anything. Not so much because he had no retort. No argument just seemed silly, and he was a little surprised to be hearing something like that from someone like her. The brain is just an output device? Human thought actually occurs somewhere else? Did Lotus really think that, he wondered? It was a little creepy, Junpei thought. It sounded altogether too much like a bizarre cultish religion. Maybe that's the cause of Seven's amnesia. Oblivious to Junpei's increasing discomfort, Lotus continued. If memory is actually stored somewhere else, in some sort of main body, somewhere, maybe he hasn't forgotten anything at all. He's just having a difficult time accessing his memories because the monitor, his brain, has been damaged. I suppose that would explain Aphasius and Blindsight, too. Perhaps they actually can speak or see. The monitor just isn't functioning properly. Hmm. I guess people with prosopagnosia could be suffering from the same thing. W wait a minute. Prosop... what? He knew what aphasia was from watching medical dramas on TV and Blindsight was easy enough to guess, but he'd never heard of the word prosopagnosia before. What, you've never heard of prosopagnosia? Lotus spun around in her chair to look at him. Junpei just shrugged and shook his head. Nope. What is it? Well, to put it simply, it means a condition where the mind can't distinguish between human faces. In other words, my face would look the same as Clover's or even yours. So they can't remember faces, which is how most people rec recognize each other. That means people with prosopagnosia have trouble recognizing even people they're close to. Usually, they can make do by associating people with other things. Their voices, their clothes, their hair. Does that mean other people's faces look... like... blanks? No. No, I don't think so. You've seen monkeys, like in a zoo, right? To you and me, all the monkey faces look the same. Even though they've obviously got faces. It's almost impossible for a human to distinguish between them. The zoo staff that works with them would learn to identify different monkeys, eventually, but you or I couldn't unless one had a scar or something else to set it apart. That's how people would be to someone with prosopagnosia. Prosopagnosia, huh? Didn't even know that kind of thing existed. Junpei did his best to act as though the entire lecture hadn't gone entirely over his head. And, uh, uh what were we talking about? The idea that your brain is just an output device like a monitor. Are you serious about that stuff? Not really. I was just kidding for about half of it. What about the other half? Well, I guess I was just adulting? Not funny. <laughs> Lotus' smile had something rather masochistic to it. It's nothing more than a story I made up out of boredom. Don't take it seriously. It was the first thing that came to mind, and I just talked about it to kill time. But, it looks like I don't need to talk anymore. Why? I don't have to kill time any longer. As she spoke, Lotus raised her right arm high, and brought it down on the enter key. The program only took seconds to analyze the system. 
Chunks of text flickered on and off in quick succession, and then a line of numbers appeared, blinked, and disappeared. The screen cleared, and all that was left was the word accepted. <laughs> Piece of cake. Lotus would clearly have patted herself on the back if it would not have made her look entirely ridiculous. After a few seconds, the accepted disappeared to be replaced with nine squares arranged in a three by three square. The hell's that? No idea. It looks like a puzzle. Suddenly, Lotus stood up. And we're allowed to continue our puzzling once more. So that's an interesting thing she was talking about. How... If I can quickly get through this. How... Uh, all brains are sort of, how all brains might sort of be connected in a way, where, uh, all of our information comes from the same place and our brains just make it look like, you know, there's something there. Like, that's where information comes from. And it sort of fits in with what she said in Door 4 about communicating through fields that we couldn't see. For example, if one, if we all come from the same area, if all of our thought processes come from the same sort of area, what if we were able to talk to each other in that area and not in a typical way like we do from day to day? That would sort of be like psychic powers, you know, like, you know, telekinesis, or telekinesis is, is moving objects, but you get what I'm trying to say. Telepathy, that's the word. It was just at that moment that we, he heard a voice behind him. It was Clover. Hey Junpei, do you have a minute? He put the puzzle aside for the moment and walked over to Clover. What's up? I, um, I wanted to ask you something. Junpei, you went into door 5 with my brother, right? Did you hear him say, like, anything weird? So, previously, when we went through door 8, Clover was going to ask us a question, but then decided to not. Uh, and it seems that he was going to ask if, you know, Snake said anything weird, but since we hadn't spend, spent any time with him, Clover's like, eh, you probably don't know anything. Why is she asking me this, Junpei wondered. The more he thought about it, however, the more it made sense. Snake had been gone for a long time. Clover was quite attached to her brother. Of course she would have worried about him thought back to when he'd gone through door 5, hoping he might remember something, even a small something that would help her. However... Sorry, Clover. I can't really think of anything. I mean, he did mention that his hearing exceeds that of a regular person or something like that, but that's about it. Okay. Clover's words were barely audible. She nodded vaguely to Junpei and turned to walk away. Hey, uh, wait a minute. Hmm? Look, I don't know if I should ask you things, but if you don't mind, I was hoping you could tell me if, uh, if Snake, um, I mean, was he born? You're talking about his eyes. Yeah. No, he wasn't born blind. When he was a kid, he got in an accident. A really bad car accident. He couldn't see after that. And his arm. His arm? Yeah, my brother's left arm is, um, it's not like a normal person's arm. It's fake. It's not a real arm. The accident hurt him really badly. To save him, they, they had to cut off his arm. Is that all you wanted to ask me? Talking about her brother had clearly taken a great deal out of Clover. Junpei nodded. Look, I'm, I'm sorry for making you talk about all that painful stuff. Clover only shook her head and walked off down the stairs. <sighs> all the stuff with Clover is incredibly depressing. And I'm not putting any of the blame on her. It's not like, like she's not a kid, but she still is pretty young. She's a teenager, she's 18, which is still a teenager. It's still pretty young. So, it is very sad that she's having to deal with the loss of a loved one at this point. And, you know, obviously dealing with the loss of a loved one at any point is incredibly detrimental to, you know, your, met your mental health. 
but still, obviously, at her young of an age, you know, dealing with the loss of someone that she is that incredibly close with is absolutely horrible, and it, you know, it's just depressing to think about. Anyways, that's going to be it for today. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye!